Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, a little better, not so much. but um, We are here for both a great and a sad occasion. The great part is that we're celebrating Mark's uh, simply remarkable career and sending him off to whatever will be in his next great chapter. The sad part is that we are losing him as a member of our faculty here at Bowdoin College, but after 38 years, maybe it's okay. <laughs> Um, let me first say, Mark, that it was an honor to be asked by you to open, uh, and I'll not take too much time, but hopefully just enough time to do, uh, to do this justice, but thank you. Uh, and Cassie, to you and your family, your parents are here, I know, and, and uh, your kids, so yes, there you are. Uh, so we're here to celebrate um, the amazing career of Mark, Mark Wetley, the A. Leroy Greeson Professor of Art. And he has had a profound impact since his arrival 38 years ago in 1985. He received his uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts and then his MFA from the University of Miami in, first in 71 and then in 73 and spent um, several tours at other schools as a faculty member coming to Bowdoin both as a tenured faculty member uh, and to chair uh, the Department of Visual Arts with a mandate to grow it, expand it, make it even more robust. Um, and did so beginning in 1985. He chaired the department from uh, 1985 until 2007, a record that I would suggest no one ever wants to beat. Uh, and then again from 2010 to 2013. Under his leadership, uh, the faculty expanded, the number of majors has grown significantly, uh, and the curriculum and the educational artistic focus moved from being primarily about drawing uh, with aspects of uh, printmaking, photography, and sculpture to one that is evenly balanced today, where in fact to be an art major, a visual arts major here at Bowdoin College requires uh, exposure and engagement with all four of those disciplines. As part of his uh, leadership in chairing the department, he also grew our relationships with artistic institutions throughout Maine. In addition to his service as chair, um, Mark's done other things as well, but uh, the other thing for which he uh, is widely known and for which the college will be forever grateful is his involvement with every major building project since 1992, beginning as the chair of the Smith Union Planning Committee. <laughs> That's Mark on the right with Bob Edwards in the middle at the dedication in 1996, Mark, I think. Is that, do I have that right? Something like that. Um, uh, but uh, you haven't aged a bit, Mark, I want you to know that, and you look good in a hard hat. Um, I witnessed firsthand uh, the very powerful role uh, that Mark plays in shaping the physical construct and the aesthetic of our campus. He's offered incredible and thoughtful advice and insights, and those that are accessible even to a college president. It's been free from the usual and understandable politics and self-interest that can sometimes creep into these projects. And his strong hand and his keen eye have been critical to projects as varied as the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, the Watson Arena, Park Row, Harpswell Apartments, and our two newest buildings, the John and Lyle Gibbons Center for Arctic Studies and Barry Mills Hall, which we will dedicate next week. His murals are in the Children's Center and in Hawthorne Longfellow Library. And one apparently is hidden behind a wall or something in the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, which is a story I didn't know about, but I have to go figure out what that's about. His art is in the presidential dining room in Thorne. Uh, two pieces hang in the museum. Particularly meaningful to me, and I know to many others from conversations that we've had, uh, is his painting, Under a Northern Sky. It hangs in Cleveland House. It's been there since it was created in 1992. And it is among my very favorite pieces of art. I never tire of exploring it, and I will miss it when Julianne and I head down the road in uh, a month or two. Mark is a gifted and amazing teacher, beloved by generations of students, serious artists, as well as students whose only opportunity to make art and, and understand themselves through that process has come through a class that Mark has taught. Last academic year, I had the opportunity firsthand to witness Mark in the classroom, when he asked if I would model for his drawing class. <laughs> Let me first assure you that no clothing was removed in this process. 
Now, I had some trepidation on, about this because, as you can imagine, no one ever knows how students will draw the, pres the president, but <laughs> you can see where that could go. All that said, it was an amazing experience. I sat for about 30 minutes while the students were in a semicircle with their easels. Mark walked from easel to easel, often making a small comment to a student, sometimes saying nothing, sometimes offering the class a comment. All quiet, deliberate nudges, a light touch. Then the portraits were hung on the wall. Students offered their thoughts on what they'd drawn as well as commentary on others. Uh, and Mark provided his critique. Some of them were, I have to say, simply amazing. And perhaps there are some students in here who drew some of those. A couple of them made me look like the Hulk. Um, <laughs> Which at the thought, and initially I was like, hmm. But then I thought about it. I thought, that's not bad. I can take that. So, uh, But the, se the, the, the session was simply magical. And it was, it was the essence of, of watching a great teacher at work. Uh, and that um, hour with Mark and his students will be among uh, uh, my favorite moments of my time at the college. And of course, there is Mark Wetley, the artist. He is an exceptional and widely acclaimed artist. He's had many shows, solo and in group, in Maine, New York, Los Angeles, Paris, among many other cities. He is the first living artist to have a solo show at the Portland Museum of Art in 1989. His work is in their collection, as well as in the collections at the Met and a number of other acclaimed museums. He's had fellowships from major institutions in this country and around the world that support art. And he's done public art commissions at a number of places, including the Muskie School and Osher Map Library at the University of Southern Maine, Midcoast Hospital, which is a remarkable piece, and the Knox County Courthouse, among others. It is impossible to overstate the impact Mark has had on Bowdoin College, on our students, our faculty, our staff, our campus over the last 38 years. Julianne and I both feel so fortunate to be able to come to know Mark and Cassie and to call you our friends. We are all very sad to see Mark leaving the faculty, but we are thrilled for what you will do in your next chapter, Mark. So please join me in welcoming our A. Leroy Greeson Professor of Art, Mark Wetley. Everybody. I have to tell you about uh, having Clayton as a model. I heard Michael Caine interviewed on Fresh Air once, and he says as an actor he learned that the more powerful character you play, the less you should move. So I knew Clayton would be just really good, and he was. So uh, Clayton, thank you for that, and to all of you for being here. It's really very touching to see faces from uh, virtually every chapter. Bridget Spath is here as one of the first people I met. Uh, others, Edgar, I've known for all this time, and others sitting there in the middle that I've only known for a year or two, and that's really quite wonderful, so thank you. Can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Great. Um, I'm going to read this so I don't lose track of anything. Uh, I also want to thank a handful of people who are indispensable in pulling this together. Our departmental coordinator, Gina Warren, and our visual resources curator, Jen Edwards. Thanks also to Frank Goodyear, Laura Latman, Jose Ribas, and Amanda Skinner of the Bowdoin Museum for their help and coordination. I'm grateful to one of my painting students, Leila Rafael Mayeri, class of 24, for the photo of me that appears on the poster, and to my friends in the Office of Communications and Public Affairs who helped to spread the word. Thanks also to art writer Edgar Allen Beam, sitting right over there, for providing the title of today's talk, which I borrowed from his article about me in the Bowdoin Magazine in 2007. Edgar has reliably been the best and most insightful writer about my work that I've had the pleasure of reading, not including Pam Smith's poems. Um, thanks to the Dean's Office and the Visual Arts Program, as well as our friends in dining, for hosting the reception following the talk, which will be at about 6 o'clock in Main Lounge in Moulton Union, and to which you are all invited. I'm grateful to Tony Sprague, Director of Summer Events and Programs, and his crew for their technical support today, including recording this event. Above all, my thanks to Cassie Jones, who, lucky for you, helped me edit this talk brilliantly, <laughs> and who cleared vast sections of our calendar to allow me to create it. 
Oh, wonderful to have her parents, Sarah and Lanny Jones, here today from their home in Princeton, New Jersey, as well as their granddaughter and our niece, Jane Urcioli, class of 23. I'm also just so delighted that my daughter, Ren, and son, is Reed still there? He left. Oh. <laughs> Classic. Um, <laughs> so uh, if I was going to say, if I can get through the next 50 minutes without being upstaged, it'll be a family record. Uh, this lecture is dedicated to each of them. Uh, I have a lot to cover, so to make it more manageable, both for you and for me, I've divided the talk into 18 vignettes, uh, like songs on an album, poems in a book, or scenes in a film. Once I had that idea, I decided to edit the scenes, oh, time to start, like a Quentin Tarantino <laughs> movie. So some things will be out of chronological order, and the ideas in one section might not be fully apparent until another one, just to give you something to look for and enjoy, like Easter eggs. Also, before I give a talk, I have a policy of the following caveat. Everything I tell you today is in retrospect and hindsight. When I did this work, I had no idea where I was going or where it would lead to. It was all in the dark. I had no idea how one piece connected to the next or how one body of work connected to the next. You just move forward and follow your hunches. And so please don't confuse anything I say in retrospect for how I make art, which is in, not in that way. So let's dive in. Uh, this, oh, I better stay closer. Uh, this marks my 50th uh, reunion year as a, a MAMFA, that's our terminal degree, at the University of Miami. Here's my class, that's me in the middle. Uh, that's my friend John Hover, and to my uh, left is Lisa Parker Hyatt. The three of us are still in touch on social media almost every day. I've lost track now of Marty, Nikki, and uh, Thad. This is also the 50th anniversary of my first drawing class. Uh, I haven't been teaching all that time, but I started full-time teaching in 76. So it was pretty nearly all that time that I've been teaching. Uh, this uh, occasion is also very important to me because it's Jane Urcioli's graduation year from Bowdoin. And here we are on the roof of the Met about 20 years ago. <laughs> I've known Jane since she's about five months old. Departures. Um, the question I'm asked most often, by the way, I noticed that the uh, light in these is a little bit dark. So these are not going to be optimum, but that's actually to my advantage because you have to imagine the best version <laughs> that, that they could be, and that might even be better than they are. Um, so I've worked in so many different idioms and different veins. The question I get more, most often is, especially when an audience gets kind of comfortable with one of them, and then I go off and do another, uh, there can sometimes be discomfort. Why did you do that? Um, and one of the things I want to do here today is hopefully uh, clear that up, maybe for once and for all. Um, I'm not going to try to give a uh, typical artist lecture like we did this, and then we did that, and we did that. Uh, like I said, we're going to break it up, but I'm also going to, rather than focus on objects, I'm going to focus on patterns of making and cycles in make making. So the epigram for this talk is the very famous Eliot quote, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Arrivals. I put big, bold numbers there so you know where we are. There's 18 of these. Um, some, some of them are very, very short. Um, I got here in 1985, but I was preceded a year prior by a painting of mine in a traveling show. This one was in a show called West Coast Realism. When I got to Bowdoin, this is, I think, the first painting I made. I set it up in the Visual Arts Center where uh, I was housed at the time. And another one. And this is me arriving at Bowdoin and being so excited. This is uh, my colleagues. Well, no, this is still standard issue. Uh, furnishings that you see them in, the, in the art department. Uh, so this is my celebration of arriving at Bowdoin, chapter four. In 2007, I built this airplane. It is a life-size replica of a Piper Cub aircraft. And among many other things, it was a memoir of the one my dad built uh, in 1956. Now that is me at six years old. Has Reed returned? Yes. There he is. Reed, that's me the same age as you are now. Six and a half. You, it's your birthday like two weeks ago. <laughs> um, so one of those cycles that we're talking about today. And I grew up building airplanes and competing and often winning with them. And those taught me two habits. I got really good with my hands and I also learned how to knuckle down and achieve things. Um, this is my dad, Ralph Wetley. And growing up, um, uh, he would read us poetry at night and also stories. And he would read us Longfellow, Bowdoin's own, 
and a poem called The Builders has this stanza, which by the way, he had written and he had it over his workbench. In the elder days of art, builders wrought with greatest care, each minute and unseen part for the gods see everywhere. That is Ralph Whitley's motto, and it's pretty much become my motto. And it means craftsmanship like this, even when you're building a 35-foot wing. So here we are working. I started this in the summer of 2007 and invited him up. He was living in Florida. And uh, he went to work with me on it. And then uh, Anne Goodyear, sitting over there, was very wonderful. And this piece was shown at the Center for Maine Contemporary Art. She said, do you know what Marcel Duchamp said about propellers? And I said, no. And uh, he, he visited the 1912 Paris Air Show with Brancusi and Leger. Wouldn't you like to be part of that event? They look at an airplane, and Duchamp says, who can do anything better than this propeller? Can you? And I just love this. This is my world. He's seeing across boundaries of material culture. He's not just saying we can only be satisfied by art and art and uh, industry is another thing. Um, they are different things, but uh, as you see in his work and others, uh, there's a crossover there which I very much appreciate and which this piece was partly about. So here's my dad, age 83, doing something that I can't really do at age 73. And then 10 years later, age 93, uh, we did an artist talk together, which was one of the great experiences for me. Here in the front row, lower left, are actually Ellen Golden and Dwayne Poluska. And we very sadly lost Dwayne three years ago last month, or two months ago. Um, and then we lost my dad in 2021. Uh, two men that figured very large in my life and I admire and love so dearly. Uh, Dwayne was my dealer at Icon Gallery for all the years that I was in Brunswick and is uh, dearly missed by so many of us in this room, I know. Uh, the spirit of my dad follows me everywhere. So here's a mural I painted at the De Cordova in 2015. Megan Brady helped, and so did Cassie Jones. Um, and here's me, 35 feet off the ground, detailing with a number eight watercolor brush. <laughs> and that's got Ralph Wetley written all over it. Uh, I carry that same uh, impulse, that same aesthetic into my representational work. I will just follow uh, uh, light and shape and form right down the rabbit hole. Um, but as we'll get to in a few minutes, I also know when to stop. This is my friend, uh, Ann Minnick, in her studio in Philadelphia. Ann and I have been friends for a really long time. We met in a printmaking class, the University of Miami, 1968. I was a typical undergraduate. She was a returning student. We were also good friends with Juan Gonzalez, and the three of us would hang out and share studio visits, and we were just a cohort. We were very, very close. Um, sadly, uh, 25 years ago, um, Juan and I showed at the same gallery in New York and other things like that. 25 years ago, we lost Juan, and I'd painted this painting uh, a few years before, but when he passed away, this painting somehow melded with his memory, and it's not showing up really well. It is dark, and there's a lot of chiaroscuro. The leaves really go off into the dark, and uh, it was my memorial to him. And then, at an AIDS auction, David Becker, 70, buys this painting. It's in his collection. David passes away, sadly, 10 years ago, and he gives the painting to Bowdoin. So this painting now has had this beautiful route from the University of Miami with Juan through his death, through making it, and now it's sitting next door, I think. Steve Perkinson very wonderfully uh, had it in his office in uh, HL. Um, this is a drawing by Ann Minnick called Letter for Mark. What you're looking at is a four-page letter that I wrote in 1978 and a portrait that Ann did of me. I'll break this down a little bit. So here's the portrait, and before you think this is how I looked in the 70s, <laughs> it's not. This is, this is Anne's visionary portrait of me. She actually, in a letter to me, wrote that she wanted to be kind of genderless, and, or gender fluid, call it what you will. Um, and it reminds me, there's a couple trompe l'oeil effects of loose hairs. That's not a schmutz on the slide. That's part of the drawing. Um, it reminded me of this episode uh, when Picasso finished this painting of Gertrude Stein, a friend said, this looks nothing like her, and he apparently replied, it will. <laughs> and I think, I think maybe Anne's got me here. So here's the letter, but you're not looking at my letter, you are looking, hold, just wait to hear that, you're looking at a representational drawing of my letter. Anne sat down with a blank piece of paper. First, she turned it into graph paper. Those blue lines are her. Then she put this kind of pink cloud on it. The slide's a little schmutzy, it's weird. 
And then she transcribed word for word, letter for letter, space for space, my handwriting, indistinguishable to me from my own letter. She transcribed the four pages of the letter, just like that. And in this letter, this letter is incredible because it, it's a, it comes at an inflection point in my entire life, my teaching life, my artistic life. February of 78, things were about to change. And it's in this letter. And she chose that letter, maybe on purpose. So here's something. Something you said to me when I was in New York was very important, to lock myself away and do a painting that was so personal and private that I wouldn't dare show anybody. Uh, Anne sees right through me. I think she sees through most people. And she's also a truth teller. And she wasn't afraid to give me that advice because she could tell I was not living up to what I should be doing. And then later in the letter, I felt this idea was partly responsible for the first painting assignment I gave this semester to advanced painters to do the worst painting they could imagine, one they would be ashamed to have anyone know was theirs. This is the first time I gave that assignment, and I've given it at Bowdoin several times. Maybe some of you got my worst painting assignment. But a point here is that uh, an idea that was going on in my studio bleeds right off into my teaching, and vice versa, as you will see. Later in the letter is this paragraph. I have 12 pins in my US map and a few more to come. And what I'm uh, referring to here is I was applying for jobs. And wherever a job was, I put a pin in the map. It was my way of keeping track of where my options were. Uh, one of those pins in February of 1978 was in Bowdoin College. Two months after I wrote this letter, I interviewed at Bowdoin College. So here's my history. I've taught at three schools, the University, or rather, uh, Cal State uh, Long Beach, uh, Cedar, uh, University of Northern Iowa, and Bowdoin, as you know. And when all the pins were pulled, and these were the last three pins, I had this incredible drawing, a straight line that terminates at the oceans, and in the middle is Cedar Falls, Iowa. And uh, I just love this. Uh, the thing I'm most happy to share with you uh, tonight is this painting, uh, this drawing, was just gifted by Anne and her son Stephen to the Bowdoin Collection. So this drawing will be in the Bowdoin Collection, another wonderful marker. It's given in honor of my retirement, but it actually marks the beginning of my path, T.S. Eliot again, um, uh, quite wonderfully. And uh, is anybody from the do, are we, do we have this in, in Main Lounge? Yes. yes. OK, great, great. Um, we had made plans. If you go to the reception, this drawing will be on display in Main Lounge. So you can see it in person in about 40 minutes. In 1999, Julie McGee, a Bowdoin alum who now teaches at the University of Delaware, was teaching here. And she approached me about team teaching a course in mural painting. And we tried to work on it. It didn't work out from her end. And I ended up teaching a course in uh, mural painting. And uh, this is one of those times, and I bet you no other teacher in the room has done this. I taught something I hadn't done before. It happens. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but uh, I knew some great muralists. In Los Angeles, I was friends with Judy Baca, who was a famous muralist in LA. So I'm immediately writing to Judy about what paint do you use? How do you prepare the wall? I learned what I needed to learn to get the class going. Uh, we had a few different projects. And this one, this wall had been blank at Druck and Miller. And each student in the class, and it was a terrific class, um, came up with a design for it. The science faculty chose the one they wanted most by Courtney Brecht, who's sitting right over there. Uh, and this is Courtney's piece, and it's held up so beautifully, and the class painted it together. We should have a list on here of the names on this mural because it's turning into a masterpiece. Uh, it already is, but I mean in terms of lists of artists. So here, are two, a couple years after doing that, I paint one of my own. This is my first mural, so right out of the gate. But fortunately, I paid attention to my own class, so I knew what to do. Um, and I needed help on this, so I hired two recent graduates, Cassie Jones and Kyle Dury. Other projects we have done, if you've had coffee in the cafe, you've been in one of our installations. I built those lamps up above because we wanted to make a more intimate setting, and we painted the walls. Um, we also, uh, Clayton referred to this, uh, did this, uh, it was a coordinated effort with my painting one class, but we uh, did this piece in the basement of HL. Um, so here we have uh, the four panels. They're 10 by 10 foot each, acrylic paint. Um, I wasn't so foolish as to try to illustrate four quartets. It's far too complex and rich. It doesn't give itself over to that. But there are visual elements, and there are themes and uh, ideas that are there. One, I learned quickly, four quartets. You might think all oh, the be four seasons. Of course, uh, Eliot's smarter than that. They're actually about the transition between things, things moving from one to the other. And this one, I believe, was autumn into winter. And then uh, 
so I'm like, no, I'll, I'll get it later. Um, uh, Frank is here, I saw, he'll know. And in fact, when I showed this to Frank, I was hoping for his approval since he taught four quartets here. Uh, Engl uh, Franklin Burroughs, our uh, uh, retired English professor. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, Mark, I, I just remember the poem being much darker. I'll never forget that. And it's so much better, I didn't dare do it, if you hear Frank's luscious South Carolina accent, when he says it, it's just really, really great. Uh, the last one, Little Gidding, is in fact the poem in which those lines I shared with you appear. And um, the mural itself enacts this line. The first panel had a field of pink roses, the last panel a, pink, uh, panel, a field of yellow roses. So again, we're returning to the same place, but knowing it for the first time. But it's not the first time I painted something like that. Um, I told you I'd never painted a mural. This is me, age 17, and I was hired to paint this Fiat. Oh, Alison Cooper will appreciate this. Um, paint this Fiat from head to toe in kind of the Peter Max style. So uh, yes, I had been there before. So this guy walks up to God and says, God, is it not true that to you a billion years is but a second? And God said, yeah, pretty much. And then he said, well, God to you is not a billion dollars worth a penny? And God said, sure. He said, so God could have a billion dollars? God said, sure thing, just a second. <laughs> so when this slide goes up, and many of you have been to my talks before, you're thinking, oh no, he's going to tell the story about seeing Vermeer on a school field trip to the Met when he was 13. And I, I'm going to fool you, I'm not going to do that. What I'm going to tell you is that uh, about... Four years later, I'm a first year at the University of Miami, and my teacher is this man, Martin Hoffman, who passed away about 10 years ago, and he taught me how to see Vermeer. So I had seen a Vermeer, but I didn't know entirely how to see one. He had done his research, and he knew so much about them, and he was my first entry into looking at Vermeer's work. This is a self-portrait he did, and this is the Martin Hoffman I remember, who was kind of a wild, kind of hippie freak, guitar-playing uh, oddball, just absolutely wonderful, and a super talented painter. And if you've seen his work, you might have seen it because he uh, made this cover for the Blondie album cover. And uh, he and Deborah Harry were an item. <laughs> um, so here I'm at age 22, uh, the way I look at paintings, which is like peeling back the layers with my laser beam eyes uh, in the Amsterdam. And then here I am age 62, less hair, uh, in uh, the Louvre. And here's a later point where I did a drawing of that. I've never done a painted study of a Vermeer. I somehow don't feel the need to, but I love to draw it. So lately, you've probably heard there's a huge show of Vermeers in uh, Amsterdam. And along with it, you probably maybe read that there's a reality show in which contestants compete to see if they can paint their Vermeer. Now, someone has been doing this for over 50 years. I was amused. But it was um, a little bit like, uh, like when you have a band that you really love and they just come out and it's just you and your friends going to a local club just watching the band and they're your band and no one else knows about them and that's the best way. But then they get famous because they're good and then before you know it, they're in Madison Square Garden and you feel weird because you still like the band but not all these other people like the band and do they like the band for the right reason? And <laughs> it, it just gets kind of like icky and that's how I'm feeling about Vermeer this summer. Uh, now, Vermeer has had waves of, of devotees. I'm not claiming I was anything special. But now, now we're kicking that up a super notch. So anyway, um, when you go to a Vermeer uh, gallery, and this is what I really want to talk to you about, uh, after I stopped looking at the Vermeers, I'd very often look to the next wall and I would see his contemporaries, like Der Bork or De Hook. Um, and very quickly I started asking myself, oh, they're so dark. I'd ask myself, why do I love this painting? I'm absolutely enchanted and knocked out. And that painting doesn't touch me at all. I respect it, beautifully painted, it's all great. But this one captivates me, and why is that? And I sensed the answer to that would be important for me to know. So here's a detail of that Vermeer. Here's a detail of that uh, De Hoek. Or uh, rather, uh, did I say De Hoek? Which one was it? To Bork. Um, on Canley, these paintings are 11 years apart, and Vermeer is the latter one. So this circle of Delft artists was, were painting very similar subject matter, domestic interiors, women writing letters, receiving letters, and uh, uh, such as that. Um, and the thing I deduce fairly quickly is that in his contemporaries, they tend to paint the objects. He paints the light on the objects. So I had that little insight pretty early on. 
And you can see it a little bit, this terrible slide, how he paints pearls. He doesn't paint the individual pearls. He paints a line of gray with dots on it and little dots behind it. He's not thinking about pearls. He's thinking about, look at the ribbon there uh, at the end of her fingertips. Look at her hands. Look at the edges in the uh, other painting, which are a little bit firmer, and the Vermeer kind of softened. Well, we have a good idea why that was, don't we? And uh, there's some controversy about this, but I'm going to come up very quickly and say that I absolutely believe that Vermeer used a camera obscura. And if you don't know what that is, it's a, a, a camera obscura is the principle that light passing through a small hole will project an image on a flat plane. With the addition of a lens, you can then focus that. Uh, this is a scene from that movie that some of us saw, and it's Colin Firth showing Scarlett Johansson uh, how his camera obscura works. Um, I believe absolutely that he uh, used this, and some scholars who I respect don't, and that's a conversation for another day. But for my money, and this is probably something like what he would have seen through the camera obscura, uh, for my money, um, the magic in Vermeer is that he embraced the camera obscura. It had been in use. Canaletto used one, other people used one, but they tended to try to hide their tracks. They would use it perhaps to find compositions or nail the figure and all that, but they would return to natural observation or the look of it. I'm not enough of a scholar to know were they trying to hide their use of a mechanical aid or do they prefer the look of their natural vision? Whatever it was, the thing about Vermeer, and I don't hear enough scholars comment on this, he went for it hook, line, and sinker. He is not holding back that he's painting what he saw in a lens, my personal opinion. Is Susan Wagner here? Yeah, we're going to have to have a, here's where Susan comes in on this. Um, but here's the idea I really want to get across is I think not only was this a tool for him, for other artists that used it, it was a means. For him, it was an end. I think he was fascinated by this little world inside there. If you've ever seen the image in a camera obscura, it is haunting. It is absolutely beautiful. It's otherworldly. It's like you're looking into a parallel world, even though when you look up, it's right there in front of you. You look back down, and it's turned again into this kind of ghostly uh, precinct. Uh, they have some in cities, you can go look at a camera obscura and it shows you what's going on around. And in fact, uh, Abe Morell did this wonderful camera obscura image. By the way, when I walked in here, the quad looks just like that today. People out on the quad, is crazy. And projected it on the inside of the uh, rotunda of the College of Museum of Art and made a photograph of that. Uh, so these images are just captivating, they're kind of enchanting. I think Vermeer was enchanted by that image and he wanted to paint it that way. So here we have the lace maker. Now look at this. Who paints threads like that? I guarantee Terborg would not paint the threads like that. They have turned into something other. And then the computer comes along and helps me. The alt text for this slide when I brought it up on my computer, <laughs> a, picture, a picture containing anthropod and vertebrate lobster. This is like a dream world. He's like Salvador Dali. I mean, threads have turned into a lobster. Things are... Things are like spinning out of control. And that's the beauty. He's, he's making a parallel universe on his canvas. Now, this is pushing my luck even more. Um, Vermeer was an exact contemporary and lived like three blocks away from Anton von Leeuwenhoek, the, uh, basically the discoverer of microbiology. So the zeitgeist to me in Delft at that time is people kind of looking behind the obvious and trying to suss out something else. I really believe that Vermeer was in that same frame of mind, not a scientist. He was the, in the Guild of St. Luke, identified as an artist, but I do believe he was as fascinated by breaking down optical experience in a somewhat parallel way that von Leeuwenhoek was down the block, breaking down what lives inside matter, living matter. So here's me trying to compete in that uh, Dutch show, but I entered uh, many years ago. So there's Vermeer and there's my shot, and here's a the detail. These are getting really chewed up by the projector, but you get the idea. This piece is actually inspired by Durer's Melancholia, but using what I'd learned from Vermeer. Uh, this one was more of a straightforward one with a title I stole from Talking Heads. <laughs> a detail of that and a detail of that. Um, I was going to pause here because there's another relationship I want to talk about, and that is uh, to photorealism. Uh, I was an undergraduate when this painting uh, was first shown. It just swept us away, it's huge. 107 inches, like nine feet high, something like that. Uh, it just bowled us over. I was never a photorealist, and I never felt like one, and that is because the photorealist, and they said so, wanted to paint what a photo looked like. I did not want to paint what a photo looked like. I used photos, 
but I wanted them maybe like Vermeer's Camera Obscura as a doorway into what things look like in another sense. Not how they look in real life. Like Vermeer, I wanted to paint a kind of a parallel, dreamy, idealized might not be the word, but I didn't want the cold, hard look of the photorealist. That was not my gambit. This was my inspiration. So when I'm painting that, I'm thinking about this, not about those other artists. Now the photorealist, for a, a young painter in 1969, made re representational painting possible in a real way. There were other representational painters, but that was not the dominant language. So it, it kind of like opened up a door. And I walked through it, but I did not walk through it with them. I had another uh, agenda in mind. And then I thought you'd like to see this. This is our Halloween 2015. That's Wren, picture of Wren right there. She's a one years old, and the shutter just went off at the right time. She's in exactly the right pose. Um, we brought this Baroque frame. That's, if you can't see, that's me as the museum guard, uh, holding up the painting for you to see. And that's Cassie as Vermeer. Uh, how the paintings get made, some of you have seen this part before. The representational paintings are made from photos. This is a reference picture I took on an apartment on McKean Street, just down the road. Um, and this is the, God, they didn't really shoot up. Um, this is the painting I started based on this photo. The painting is four by five feet, basically. It's basically this painting that hangs in our museum, or at Cleveland House. But this is uh, step one. Uh, the first thing I need to tell you is that I am first and foremost a formalist. Before I think about any feelings, ideas, intentions, I simply want a good design. I want a good, strong composition. Pierre Bonnard had a wonderful quote. He said, Pierre Bonnard's a painter. I should have a slide, I guess. Uh, he said, a painting that is well composed is half done. Completely agree with that. So I worked very hard to get the composition locked up, um, a la Mondrian, another Dutch painter by coincidence. So two years ago, I'm painting this. Now, this painting on the left has nothing to do with painting the right, except that I made it. And if you start to look, oh, I could use the pointer. Is this it? Where's the, oh, there it goes. Um, look at this narrow strip here. Look at this opening here. Look at this space here. Look at the table. So I'm not making an abstraction of that painting, but I will tell you this. If you put a rectangle in front of me, I'm going to probably end up somewhere in this vicinity. It's like my DNA. It's like my divining rod. It's like my Ouija board. I'm just going to kind of magnetically go to these division points. And I don't always, but uh, these two happen to resonate with each other. But I got that far, and I was a little bit stymied. There were things I didn't like about the movement in the painting, and I had to figure that out. And to the rescue come Cliff and Sue Olds, who um, we all love so much and are dearly, uh, dearly missed. Um, and they would take me out on their uh, boat, and we'd go sailing around Casco Bay. And um, on one trip, we went to Eagle Island. And on Eagle Island, we visited uh, Admiral Perry's summer home, which you can do if you have a boat. And we went exploring, and I went walking kind of back through here to a space right about there. And when I got to that space, I found this. Now, I was taking photographs left and right in this building. I'm always taking photographs. It's so much easier now with our cell phones. I had to wait for this to come back from the developer and all that. So I built these up, and then I looked, and I thought, that's my answer. So I plugged that into there. This is how the painting was. That's how the painting became. This is the same canvas. This, oh, wrong one. Uh, this is painted over that. The doors more or less stayed the same. The picture frame stayed. The light switch went away. The table turned into a foreshortened chair. By the way, this is so often how my work goes. Once again, I was a little stymied. I wasn't happy with this relationship. The foreshortening of the chair and the windowsill were pushing me back here too fast. I wanted to slow that down. And so to do that, I found this chair, and I put it there, and here's the painting. I also added this uh, chair rail as, again, just one more kind of way to kind of stop the movement and relate it to that other horizontal. So even on into the painting, I'm thinking about that. And until this point, I'm not thinking at all, why am I making this painting, or what's it of? But around this point, if you spend that many hours in front of something, you begin to know you're waiting for it to, to talk to you. And what this one is about is the seasons. And the room in the foreground to me is winter. This is spring and fall, and there's summer. And I called this uh, painting uh, under, well, oh, there's the how the state before. Uh, I called this under a northern sky. I'd been living here seven years, and I thought maybe I was finally entitled to say something about Maine. 
Um, so I called it Under a Northern Sky. Uh, I'm so grateful that uh, when this painting was done, 1992, Catherine Watson, who was here, uh, wonderfully, the director of the museum at the time, purchased it for the museum. And uh, even more wonderfully, for the past 31 years, as Clayton mentioned, it's been living in this room over on Federal Street, um, which I'm uh, very proud of. It only took a little bit of a break last year to be in the show at the museum with my colleagues, which I was so uh, proud to be part of. Something similar happens in my non-objective paintings. That's uh, an early state, changing, changing. And look here, this, this whole thing is being re-engineered. Um, my paintings almost always reach a crisis point. Something I thought would work falls through, and I have to uh, make another go, go at it. To be honest with you, I don't entirely trust paintings that don't do that. Uh, it makes me wonder I haven't, I've missed something. And then it starts to ossify and becomes a painting called Elizabeth Street. This was a part of a series. Another one was called Orchard Street, and if you're a New Yorker, you know those are streets in the Lower East Side that inspired these. Um, this painting, I thought, was done, and this did get done straight out. It just went great. By the way, I, I, on these, I don't use photographs, obviously, but I do sketch them in Photoshop. So I'll work them out in Photoshop, and if they feel like they have potential, I move on to the canvas. I don't color them in Photoshop because you just can't, the colors don't translate. But I thought I was done, and I even sold it. It had an owner, and I wasn't the owner anymore. But I was looking at it in my studio before I delivered it, and I was just uncomfortable, so I did this. Want to see that again? I just felt something's wrong over there. I just, it was bugging me. So I asked the owner, and they said, sure, do what you need to. So I did that. And I think it's much better. And there it is living in Brooklyn. So I want to tell you, if you own <laughs> one of my paintings, you actually own three or four of my paintings. It's a real deal. It's a bargain. So this turtle gets mugged by a gang of snails. And the police come and say, what happened? He said, I, I don't know. It all happened so fast. <laughs> so I get here in 1985. The president at that time is Roy Greeson. I very proudly for 24 years have uh, had his name behind mine, as does uh, my good friend Brock Clark. We are the uh, A. Leroy Greeson professors of art. He and I were joking about what he'll do without uh, another one. Um, but Roy came to my studio, and at that time, he would have seen these paintings. And when I have studio guests and they look at my work, um, uh, they very often will mention Vermeer, or they mention Edward Hopper, and I love that. It's all great. They might have other associations. Um, Roy comes out and says, you know, when I look at your work, I sense an influence of Magritte. I thought, oh my god. This is like a wine taster, one of those people who taste wine and say, when this was made, it was a rainy spring. I mean, it's one of those really deep angles on the work. He had no way of knowing that uh, years before, in Martin Hoffman's class, we brought our history books. He asked us to bring them to class, our Janssen books. And he asked us to just do this. He said, flip through the book slowly, looking at every page. Don't read, just look at pictures. And we did that for a little while. And when we were done, he gave us a little block of wood. And he said, now paint what you remember best. Out of all those pictures, you just saw what image stuck with you. And this is what stuck with me. So um, the thing about Magritte that I can't get over is the images are just so indelible. So the, that transcendent otherworldly quality in Vermeer is one thing, but I also love an image that just lands a punch. And a René Magritte painting, if nothing else, lands a punch. But they're also so uh, kind of fantastical. And this experience also reminds me of a wonderful, uh, I saw in a, read an interview, Francesco Clemente was asked, what makes a great painting? And he said three things. He said, first, when you see it, it pulls you into its world. Secondly, when you're away from it, you remember it perfectly, like that. And then we see it again, it's different than you remember. I love that little syllogism. So when you're looking at one of my paintings, you're not going to see like a big apple or a guy in a bowler hat. But I want to confer upon reality the same weight, stillness, momentous quality of a Magritte. Um, I just, uh, right now, our friend uh, Josephine Halverson is having a show in New York City. I just read the review. And in the review, uh, Ksena Saboleva wrote the review. She had this turn of phrase which bowled me over. She said it about um, Josephine's work. And she said that they have, the, they have a thickness of presence. 
that Josephine's work has a thickness of presence. We're all present right now, and there's a podium, and there's things going on. There's lots of things that are present. But in her work, hopefully in mine, things slow down. The clock stops a little bit. Maybe even hear the clock ticking in the next room, like a Bergman film. And you just become aware of things, that the thingness of things is just profound enough that for me, I love Magritte, but I didn't feel the need. Oh, God, you're really losing this one. Um, I didn't really need a, an apple to finish the work. This comes back around to the Piper Cub. I talked about this before as a memoir piece, and it is, but it's also a goof. It's, uh, this, is me, uh, this is me and Magritte. What happens when you park a huge thing in a, in a room? Especially a huge thing that you usually see outdoors on an airfield or in the sky. Just that simple thing. When you walk in the room, it's like the apple in the room. It's like boom, boom. That was just, that's the first catch. The second catch, and here's me in LA looking at one of my favorite paintings. Uh, we all know it's Saint Paul and Peep. Uh, it's really called The Treachery of Images. I've heard it called The Treason of Images. Um, and we all, I think, all know the gambit. There's not a pipe, it's a painting of a pipe. There's real pipes, there's words about pipes. It's kind of a semiotic round robin. And it's wonderful, I don't mean to, to be glib about it. It means a lot to me, this painting. I wanted this to be Saint Paul <laughs> un Peeper Cub. I'm, I'm quite serious. I wanted you to walk in the room, and it's as big as an apple sitting in front of you. But when you look at it, I hope the following conversation might happen. You'd say, oh, is it a real plane? And then you'd say, well, no, it's not made of the right materials, and the engine isn't right, so it's not real. Was it a model plane, maybe? And they go, well, no, because models are usually smaller than the real thing. Who would build a model of the thing the size it is? A little sense of the absurd. And then you might think, well, maybe it's a sculpture. And then you might resist that, because I haven't done anything original. I built this from plans. This is an industrial object built by hand, but to industry standards. So then you might even ask, is it art? And the critic for the Portland Press Herald thought not. <laughs> uh, Dan Candy in his review came out and said, this is not art, this is a huge craft project. <laughs> and at first I was pretty steamed, and I still am a little bit. But then, then I thought about it and I realized, wait a second, that's what I was trying to do. He couldn't even see it as art. I win, it's what I wanted. <laughs> in other words, it, it went into an existence that had, it wouldn't fall into a bucket. It wouldn't go art, sculpture, plain, not plain. I wanted to create, this is not a pipe at this scale, and I'd like to think I pulled it off. Uh, here's another angle on a similar kind of thinking in a painting of mine called Night, which is at the Farnsworth Museum which is maybe the epitome for me of this kind of painting, and it came late in working that way. When I was a kid, I'd do thought experiments, and one of them was, what does my house look like when I'm not in it? And even as a kid, I hadn't heard of Heisenberg yet, but I had an idea that if I'm there, I won't know, because I'm there, and when I'm not there, I can't know, because I'm not there. And I was at almost a little Wittgensteinian thing, too. Like, what am I gonna do with this? And I just would sit on that quandary and just kind of love it, a little bit like a Zen cone, it made my mind kind of light up. And so I wanted to make a painting that did that. I wanted to make a painting that maybe has no observer. Maybe no one is watching. Maybe no one sees this. We're seeing it, but maybe we can't see that. And that, like the Piper Cub, was one of those conundrums I wanted to pitch. I'm not sure when I show these anybody ever gets this level, but you're getting it. Um, I thought when I finished this painting, there's that old saying about there's a tree, if, it, if a tree falls in the forest uh, and no one's there to hear it, does it make a sound? I thought this is a painting of what happens when a tree doesn't fall in the forest and no one is there to hear the sound. <laughs> so this is a kind of an amazing story that I really like, chapter 13. Uh, it's 1979 and in the Cal State uh, Art Department uh, on the desk there, to save paper, they would cut up old photocopies into quarters and stack them up for note paper. And I was in there the morning of March 15th, uh, John Baldessari was giving me a talk that night, and I grabbed a stack of them, I must have had to write a note to myself or someone else, wrote on it, <laughs> stuck it in my pocket. So that night I'm in the lecture, and John Baldessari starts to talk about this book, The Shape of Time. So I want to find it out, so I grab it, pulls it out, and sure enough, there's one of those photocopies, and I write Shape of Time, Kubler. This is in the dark, I'm writing this like you are right now, I wrote this note in the dark, when I came out of the, or maybe it was the next day, I emptied my pockets and saw this. The next piece of paper under this one was this one. 
This to me was like a cosmic Ricky Jay magic show. I was just floored that that's how those two things came together. Uh, kind of even more remarkable is when I moved to Maine, I got to be friends with Abby Sean, his daughter, and I got to meet Elena Kubler, George Kubler's daughter. So again, these wonderful cycles and movements. This book became central to so much that I've talked to you about today, including the Piper Cub, and I'm gonna share a description of it. Kubler's book presents an approach to historical change which challenges the notion of style by placing the history of objects and images in a larger continuum. Kubler proposes new forms of historical sequencing where objects and images provide solutions to evolving problems. Kubler lays out a perspective where processes of innovation, replication, and mutation are in continuous conversation through time. And this could be my artist statement. This is at the core of everything I've done. And it's why someone can want to paint like Vermeer at one part of his life and wants to build a Piper Cub in another part of his life. Another uh, major figure in all my work is Mark Rothko. Uh, at his, uh, during that time, one of Rothko's critics challenged him and he said, well, these paintings are incomplete. They just feel like empty fields. There's no figure, there's no action, there's no tension between figure and ground. And he said, that's because you're the figure. Uh, this is such, just three words, and it's like lights up the whole 20th century. You're the figure. Ever since Impressionism, really, you've been the figure. That is, uh, the viewer has a proactive role in looking at paintings. But in Rothko, it, it drives that to a whole new point. Um, so here I am at the, I think, the Museum of Contemporary Art, L LA. Uh, but when I make these paintings, um, uh, I wasn't witty enough to think of that. That's what I was up to. People would ask, well, why aren't there people in your paintings, except for the, the two I showed you, the only two people paintings I've made. Um, uh, why aren't there people in them? As, and I would go to said, because you're the figure. I actually want the painting to be a device, a foil that you engage with and make your own way through the painting, not vicariously, not because it belongs to someone else. I even tip that chair just slightly, a little invitation, saying, come on over. This is you. You can be there. Um, what are those trees doing out the window? Why is that angle identical to that angle? And this is kind of chaotic, but it's orderly. Those are the things that I hope a viewer will engage upon, and in the process of doing that, discover themselves engaging in perception and thinking. So for a long time, I made paintings this size because they're only big enough to look at like this. You have to come right up to them with your face. And I didn't stop and make paintings, my non-objective paintings, many of them are here. But in the representational paintings, the next stop for me was this size. Uh, these these are paintings that are made for the body. They are somatic. There are doorknobs for your hand. There are thresholds for your foot. There are door jams for your hand. There are the backs of chairs. These are meant for you to stand there and imagine the next step, moving into that, again, like the Vermeer, that other world. Like him, I wanted to paint not this world, but another world that looked a lot like ours, but had a kind of a magic to it. And I carry that into my public art. This is a piece of mine at the University of Southern Maine the Muskie School of Public Service. When I think public service, I think community, and then I think uh, buildings. Well, I think a lot more than that, but I, we had to live somewhere. Um, <laughs> this space uh, had all these mullions going on. I was really, what are you gonna do with this, all this architectural noise going on? Um, so I thought, well, let's play along. Like, turn your wheels in the direction of the skid. Uh, this, this room's already nuts, let's keep it going nuts. Um, <laughs> But beyond that, I wanted to make an abstraction of a cityscape, kind of like a la Stuart Davis, sort of kind of a cubist cityscape. I was mostly, though, thinking again about my viewer. This is a space where people congregate, where people pass through. There's all kinds of choices to make in this space. And I wanted this to be kind of the musical accompaniment to the life of the space. So I didn't choose to put up there something self-expressive, like here's who I am. And I didn't want to put something that's like a symbol of Portland or Ed Muskie or that stuff to me is just really banal. I wanted to make something much more engaging, I hope. Somewhere along the lines, I learned that as Borges uh, was going blind, the last color he could see was yellow. I read that somewhere. And so I got in my head, he was already dead, he'd already passed away, and I thought, I'm gonna make a series of paintings that Borges could see. That's how I think. Um, so I was working on these, and it was just impossible to sustain. Uh, this kind of yellow painting is really hard to look at. For me, it was. 
So I tuned it further, and it's going to take you a minute to see with this projector, but this is that painting when it was done. I pushed all the colors right to the edge of whiteness. Um, this is the other painting. That's, uh, that's the beginning of it, and that's how it ended up. You can't see anything, can you? No. That's great. <laughs> uh, there's something there. It'll have to wait for another day. But in fact, when I show these in Los Angeles, and people, this is like Robert Ryman, it's really great. <laughs> I've got to do this, that looks great. Um, oh, when I showed these in Los Angeles, people knew I was from Maine and said, oh, this must be like snow blindness. <laughs> and then when I turned around and showed them at Icon Gallery, they, they just changed, by the way. Uh, when I showed them at Icon Gallery uh, here in town, I just was back from LA and people, oh, it must be Southern California light. Um, it was neither of those things. It was a quest for a certain kind of unity, and I'm going to lose my point here, but the thing that was, uh, I was 49 years old, and in retrospect, I had reached a certain pinnacle in the work. I felt like I had found a meeting place for Rothko and Vermeer. Inside these paintings, like the original ones, you can still see domestic imagery. When you first walk up, all you see is white. And then if you look, something starts to appear you in effect become the dark room for these paintings. You are now the camera obscura. You are seeing that by virtue of looking. I left just enough information that the human eye will adjust and find it. By the time you're done, you'll see purples and greens, yellows, all the colors are there. I wish you could see them. <laughs> um, but uh, you'd think at that point I'd reached my, I just really felt I was on top of things. So naturally being who I am, I was satisfied. I, I didn't want to make any more. I'd seen it. What's the point? So I did this. <laughs> you remember I told you that um, when I begin a representational painting, I think about formalism first. I decided to go back to that point. Rather than move forward, I decided to go back to a place where I just divide the canvas. Now, this first one I tried in 2000, uh, was based on not this painting per se, but ones I made like it, where I very often have a near room, a middle room, and a far room, and the far room is where the light is. That's a habit I've had. So I thought, let's do that abstractly. I did not stay there, though. Um, I went to becoming non-objective. Um, this is a little bit of academic nomenclature. I fully ex accept when people say, why'd you go from being a realist to being abstract? I'll say, yeah, well. Um, I never thought of myself as a realist. I thought of myself as being representational or naturalistic or words I'd use. Realist is just too sticky and weird. Um, realist can be so many things. Likewise, the other term, abstract to me means when Picasso takes a guitar and bends it and twists it and makes it blue, he said himself, the subject of his work is the gap between the guitar in your head and the guitar in front of you in my painting and the tension. So. Uh, Picasso, I understand, expressed regard for Malevich, Mondrian, even Pollock at the end of his life, um, but said, I'm not going to go there. Uh, I don't understand why you'd go there. They're, they're great at it, but it's not for me. I, on the other hand, wanted to go there. I didn't want to stop in that kind of twilight zone of abstraction for me. So very quickly, here is 24 years of research into making non-objective things on different surfaces. This is assemblage. Uh, this one is called Compared to What? It's a favorite jazz track of mine that was actually playing when you came in, but wasn't loud enough for you to know that. But go back to Spotify, look up Compared to What and play it. And you're probably wondering, if you know me, we got to chapter 15 without talking about Mirandi, who is just so huge for me. And this is my son Reed in the Princeton Art Museum. He's not that close to it. He's just pointing to it. We're far away. Um, Interesting, Mirandi is so important to me. The spirit of Mirandi is in all my representational work, but I don't paint at all like him, and I never really learned how to paint my representational paintings from Mirandi, except a certain spirit I wanted of humble objects, simple things becoming momentous, becoming present, or the thickness of their presence. Um, but in my, strangely, in my non-objective work is in this one called Compared to What? Um, that's when he kind of woke up and I started making rougher edges and fitting things together in a little kind of a different way. I was very proud Alex Katz put this in a group show in New York and a collector in Africa bought it. Uh, one called Turnstile, Salt.
Uh, these are marching through time, by the way. And we're coming right up to the most recent. The colors all got killed. So one chapter away, where we started from the T.S. Eliot, we returned to where we started. Three years ago last month, we all went through the same uh, ordeal. Uh, I've been teaching in the classroom in early March, and by the end of March, this is my classroom. It was a little setup I made at home. Uh, right there, I could put my uh, camera, and there's a little hole for the lens, and I could do demonstrations and send them to my class. We all went through this. I wasn't unique. Um, and here is me on that device uh, doing a copy of a sergeant, because we were at the point in the semester where we did copies of portraits. So like everyone else, we were in lockdown, and we had two children, both under five-ish, I think, at that time. And so we weren't going anywhere, and we were there. I don't have to describe it to you. And so I kind of turned inward on my camera, and I started taking pictures uh, all through the house. And we're fortunate to live in a house that kind of looks like one of my paintings already. And there's a, our Duane Paluska sitting there very beautifully. And this is a Dana Frankfurt painting. So I just took these pictures and put them on Instagram. This one, by the way, rather, this one might very well become a painting. Um, what I'm showing these for is that what the pandemic did is two things. It stopped me in my tracks. My production went way down. Couldn't go to my studio. Working at home was limited. Taking care of the kids was all consuming uh, for both of us. Um, and so my production turned way down. I was turning very much inward. And I just began to slow down. I slowed down on a lot of things I've been doing. And through the camera, I started to return to images. And then we're all on Zoom. So D. Ray McKeeson gives a seminar, and I decided to draw him. So the great thing about Zoom is you've got all these free models. <laughs> and then the kids like to watch Mo Willems. And then just this weekend, uh, I saw this quote from him in the New York Times. He mentioned about the uh, pandemic. Science was going to get us out of the pandemic, but art was going to get us through it. And I just love that uh, quote, because art definitely got uh, yours truly through it, as I hope it did for many people, to the extent that we're through it. Uh, then coming back to school, uh, I do draw demos all the time in class. And I'd often remark, I'd come home, see Cassie, and say, geez, I did a demo today. It was just so much fun. And just the fact that the, the fun of making an image, uh, abstract painting, I love it. That's also a kind of an image. But converging on observational world is just just a thrilling place to be. This is a portrait of Jerry Rose, class of 24, a student in the class, a painting demo, a drawing demo, a self-portrait. So uh, 1997, my paintings looked like that, and the painting in my studio right now looks like this. This is, this is not quite done. It looks a little ragged because it's not quite done. But um, I think you're going to see more of these soon. But you're also going to see more of these. Uh, people ask me, so what are you going to do in retirement? And the thing is, I'm going to do anything I want. <laughs> uh, I almost used a word in there, but I didn't use it. Um, meaning, I think I now have time that on a given day, I might do this. And then I'll go back and do this. And who's going to stop me? But, you know, they say in retirement, you always have to have one kind of like wistful, weird kind of thing that a retiree does. My secret ambition, after all this, is to be a, a cartoonist in The New Yorker. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a cartoon I sent in to them. And they wrote back very encouraged that we love this cartoon, can't quite use it, keep sending cartoons. So stay tuned. If I'm any, any good at all, I want to add New Yorker cartoonist to my resume. <laughs> That's going to be my fun thing. Finally, uh, tortillas. When I lived in Los Angeles, uh, Carlos Almaraz was there as well. He's now uh, deceased. Uh, we had mutual friends, but I read an interview with Carlos, and he said the following, I make paintings the way my mother makes tortillas. Some are good, some are bad, but she just keeps making tortillas. <laughs> and that's exactly what I plan to do. Thanks a lot.